Good afternoon. I'd like to get started. Welcome to AEG's CEO Growth Benchmarking Roundtable. Uh, the purpose of today's, today's session is to help you uh, sort of understand you know, how to make your company more effective, operationally effective, and higher value. And today's uh, session, which will take one hour, it is being recorded. Uh, the panelists will be live and can uh, interact. Attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat function, the Q&A function. Um, in this hour, what we want to do is, is understand the core value framework, understand where it came from, why it's so incredibly effective at directing people to the right activities to grow value. Uh, to get an understanding of the results of your individual assessments, we will not go through individual information on this recorded, recorded session, uh, but we will look at aggregate data we can talk about your individual outcomes and your insights at a later date. Uh, and then we'll explore some, some growth opportunities that uh, might be common to those who took the assessment and then share some best practices. We have three uh, experts from AEG to top, talk about those drivers that are the most common ones, and then talk about the value of, of a deeper dive into um, uh, your individual company. So the premise for this is, how is it possible that two companies in the same location, the same industry, the same revenue and margin, one sells at 4X, the other sells at 6X? So guy Chuck Richards uh, thought about this uh, a long time ago. He grew up in Springfield, Vermont. When he left for college, the company was one of the, the town was one of the wealthiest in the state. And when he graduated, it was not so much. Um, and he started looking at this and, and his work at, uh, at MIT, it did his dissertation on what drives uh, financial value of companies. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, about how that was. And what, what he came up with is he realized that, that think of your business as an engine. It's got gears and pulleys and valves that all work together to, to make it uh, run efficiently. But the value of your company is the ability of that engine to reliably and predictably and continuously generate revenue and profits, which makes for a successful transfer eventually. So uh, his research pulled 18 individual drivers we'll talk about in a second, but these are all kind of like gears in your engine or parts in your body. They all have to work together. And you can imagine when one part fails on your, your engine, it doesn't often uh, decrease the value by just the value of that part, but often can bring down your, high, your entire car or your car, entire engine. So what we wanna to do today is uh, the discover assessment that you took is an individual looks at your particular company, you answered the questions about these 18 drivers. Now, admittedly, it's a very quick look. It's a low resolution look at exactly um, how uh, market drivers and operational drivers are working. Uh, these, the algorithms that go into the assessment and, and produce results for you are based on you know, churning through Pratt stats and other private sector transaction data. They correct it for outliers and bubbles uh, and it is updated periodically. And the coefficients depend on your particular NAICS code, uh, the size of your company and the particular geography. So uh, a, a mining firm, a $40 million mining firm in Wyoming and a $40 million government services firm in DC could give the same exact answers, but the value and the value gap will be different. So it's an important distinction. This, this has been uh, validated. And the basis is, could we do the same thing? This is Chuck Richards who put this together. Could we do the same thing for a business that accounting does for, for generally accepted accounting principles. So he's created with a number of other individuals and researchers what are called private business standards. And that has been applied to this core value software. It's been vetted by, by, uh, by academics and business schools, as well as industry officials. And uh, this is it's a, the MIT research has been you know, validated uh, multiple times. Uh, over 40,000 companies have taste, take to, taken this assessment. Um, those that go on to use its uh, growth recommendations grow at an average 21% a year. Uh, it's used by um, uh, the National Association of Certified Valuators and Assessors. 
and other groups, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is the part of the Department of Commerce, is using that over 50% of their um, uh, groups across the country are using it to help companies, manufacturing companies grow. It's used in a couple of business schools for the, their case, their training. And uh, much to the dismay of evaluators, uh, the assessment, not in this particular one you took today, but the, the, the deeper dive, it's pretty close to a real valuation that costs a lot of money. So uh, it's been used, it's, it's being used a lot uh, by um, companies and trade associations now to get a handle on what their, their, uh, their companies are actually experiencing. So just to reflect, this is this is one part of it. Uh, yeah, when you are building a company, you're building it to grow some value and to pass on to your family and to your heirs and, and do other things with that, that value that you created. So that's what we call a sort of a twin value gap. Uh, the value between what assets you have right now and the lifestyle and the aspirations you have for when you leave this business, there's a gap and you have to fill it. And it's usually filled by a, uh, the, the business value that you can create. There's also a gap between what your business is worth now and what it has to be worth for you to close that personal gap. And finally, uh, market conditions may well determine when you transact uh, from you know, your, your own business to, to sell it to someone else. So you know, the business has to be ready to sell, you have to be ready to sell, and the market has to be ready to sell. So one of the things, and we'll talk about who AEG is and why later on, but one of the things we do is make sure that it's possible for all of those three um, you know, possibilities to align and get the most value and uh, reach your aspiration of financial uh, and asset aspirations later on. So we're just going to be talking about the business side of this right now. So if you look at your, your individual report, um, the, what's called Discover right now, will give you an enterprise value and what your company, what a company is worth now, and what it could be worth later, and there's a value gap. The reason there's a range is because this is again, it's a, it's a low resolution. Uh, more detail will close that down to a, to a single closer number. So you're going to get a core value rating that ranges between you know zero and hundred, and what this rating is is an estimate of the reliability of and confidence you can have that you're gonna be able to generate revenue and profits in the future. If you're in the 80 to 90 range, and some companies are, but you can see not many are, um, you're pretty confident that you're gonna be able to do that. If you're in the 20, 30 and 40 range, there are a lot of things going on in your company that are not locked down and it leads to a lower value of your company and high uncertainty on the part of somebody wanting to do business with you, work for you, partner with you, lend you money, uh, or buy your business, that you're gonna, that this business is, is a sustainable um, operation. The second part of the report that you got is a uh, uh, sort of what's the, the value opportunity. Now, in this case, the um, gray area is the value that's missing from the company. It's a pretty substantial amount. So 61% of the total value is missing. Uh, it does focus on the top three growth opportunities or value deficits. In this case, recurring revenue, financial, and margin advantage. The average company is missing about a quarter of its value, um, which for a, a you know, $12 million company is you're leaving $3 million on the, on the, the table. It's often like uh, considering a, a, a car with a V8 engine you've got two spark plugs that are not working. Does the car run? Probably. Uh, is it tearing up your engine? Probably. Is it getting good gas mileage? Probably not. Is it a comfortable ride? Probably not. So if you could find which of those spark plugs were missing or, uh, or fouled, then you could fix that problem and then your car would be run smoothly, just to continue the engine analogy. But beyond the individual, uh, aspects. There are some other aspects of running your business called red flags, and these could, could potentially compromise some or all of the value in your company. And we, often for entrepreneurs, uh, the biggest one is their the company is so focused on them as individuals that they came up with the idea, they brought the technology, they run the culture, they established the relationships, they hired the individuals, 
without them, the company would be considerably less. So this is a way of, of determining which of those things. In this case, it's legal and company overview. The legal, it might be you've got unsigned contracts, you've got um, you know, potential lawsuit, uh, some legal exposures. And we'll talk about that a little bit later about how to make sure that doesn't happen. And the company overview, um, can anybody understand this company? Do, do people wanna buy from you, work for you, lend you capital? Or, or buy your company, if they can't understand what the business model is, that's a problem. And we'll be talking about a little bit about that later as well. So the second aspect of, of the report that you got is some benchmarking. So the first uh, one talks about how you are in terms of confidence in your ability to generate revenue and profits relative to the, to the country as a whole, the 40,000 companies. The second, I just showed two of the three, <clears throat> Uh, do you have dominant market share or operations? These are compared to your industry and your peers. So we can we can drill down a little further, but uh, for right now on the, on this uh, the, the quick report, it gives you a sense. In this example, uh, doing a little better than average for uh, these particular for drivers. So think about what that what that actually tells you. Um, yeah. Did this confirm what you already thought? And in some cases, people go, yeah, because I gave the answers, but I didn't really appreciate how big a gap it was, or I never really thought about that. I'll tell you yeah, a, qu a quick story in, um, um, in Rochester. When Kodak imploded, it left a lot of the technology firms uh, in, in the lurch, and they were really hurting. So uh, core value was used by a, a trade association, Digital Rochester to find out what was really going on with those companies. What did they need collectively to improve their profitability? And uh, when asked individually, they said, well, we need, uh, we need capital, we need financing. And most people said that. So after doing the core value, a few people did need financing, but what it revealed was they were really missing innovation and branding. And when told that, uh, they said that can't possibly be true because we're all technologists. You know, we're innovators. And the answer was, no, you're not. You're, you know, polymer chemists who put stuff on thin film substrates for Kodak. You took that technology from your lab to your garage, and that's what you've been working on. You have no second or third products, no product line extensions. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. And branding, you're a technologist, you're not marketing and salespeople. And because they had individually said they thought they needed financing, many of the digital Rochester programs were wealth managers, financial planners, uh, commercial banks. Uh, and that really wasn't what, what drove, was driving their value. So they pivoted and provided you know, an innovation incubator and some, some branding and marketing support and uh, really turned around most of those companies. So that, that's why it can sometimes be a surprise for you know, what you actually see. If uh, anybody has any questions, we can, uh, we can uh, address those. If not, we, we will uh, we'll, we'll proceed. So this is looking at the aggregate data. So in this case, we had seven companies that take the assessment, the mean core value rating is a 66. These are fairly sizable companies. The mean revenue for the US average companies is about 7 million. But the, the ratio between the revenue and the value and, and the gap is, is pretty similar. So one of the benchmarking opportunities to say, okay, well, how do I compare? We didn't have a, a big uh, sample size in this case, but the universe is those 40,000 companies I mentioned before. So our, our challenge is, you know, if this is done for a trade association, is the trade association lagging behind the country as a whole or, or moving ahead? So that's a useful way for, for groups of companies to do that. And if you have a portfolio of companies, you can do the same thing and see where you stand relative to others. Now we get down to the interesting part is what, as a group, you all see in the individual reports and you can see what your particular uh, primary uh, challenges are and your growth opportunities. But collectively for these seven companies, um, it's operations. Am I operating as efficiently as possible? Growth, have, have I captured the growth that's possible? How fast am I growing? Financial, are all my financial systems in place? Barriers to entry, 
How am I likely to be uh, you know, outcompeted by somebody who just jumps in? And margin advantage, how am I doing as far as profitability? So each one of these for the average company, if you solve this operations problem by improving your processes, um, whether it's, it's meetings, tracking information, uh, having a framework to, uh, to organize with, you can add $400,000 to your, to your bottom line in terms of the value and based on the ratio, probably add that in revenue and you'll start to grow faster. The same thing for growth. It, are your products differentiated enough? Uh, do you understand um, how to market and how to position your company to make it possible to growth? And the financial side, um, are your financial systems in place? Do you have risk management in place? Uh, are you able to, to make sure that you your contracts and, and your policies are all in place? Um, and we'll have three people talk about this. Um, um, uh, Deborah Fell is going to talk about growth. Beth Berman is going to talk about operations. And Aaron Gase is going to talk about financial and legal aspects. And then depending on your particular industry and your market, you know, the barriers to entry. Um, other than illegal activities, how do you prevent somebody from entering your market? One thing is to make your product sufficiently strong that you're in a, in a, in a blue ocean situation. They're not in your market. The margin advantage well, if you've got growth, you've got operations and financial, um, then your margin advantage is going to accelerate. So for all three of those reasons, so you can see that each industry and each company has different opportunities. Now, what often ends up being, if you look on the right side, sales and marketing and recurring revenue, this top line growth, especially coming out of a, of a pandemic, they are the top concerns of, of many companies. Um, operations and growth and barriers to entry, they look kind of familiar. So um, you can see that the, the, the priority of you know, the seven companies is slightly different, but for the most part, um, they're, they're the same kind of things. Now, the last piece is, is red flags. None of the companies, seven companies that took the assessment have any red flags. I talked before about human resources, organizational roles. Um, when the, the, the entrepreneur or the owner is the company, even in a larger company, if they're driving sales and they're driving the culture, um, that is a high risk of losing value upon sale. Um, legal and company culture are, are the, the next issues. Uh, a lot of times people have uh, litigation either in process or uh, as, a, as a risk. Yeah, they've got uh, a lot of unsigned contracts, for example, or some, some way that they may, may have some problems. Uh, company culture, again, do, does everybody buy in? Is the company growing at, at a reasonable enough pace? The culture can be maintained. Is your management team good? And have you got some discipline in how that works? So there are times when uh, at due diligence, um, one of these things can come up and they can tank a, a, an offer pretty quickly. So this will identify those things that you can take care of uh, well in advance. And the, the value of this, it's like a house inspection. You know, if you get it done two weeks before your, your house is gonna sell, uh, you probably think, well, gee, I can't sell it. I've lost value. I could have fixed all this stuff if I had had a year or two to fix it. So what I'd like to do now is uh, go and uh, go to our, our, our experts in, in the growth area, the operations area, and the legal and financial, and let them share some of their expertise and, and views on how to actually capture that value in your uh, own assessment that you can get. So I want to introduce Deborah Fell. Um, she's a, um, an AG member, area managing partner, and um, CMO par excellence uh, for chief outsiders. Deborah, Thank you, Mark. And it's good to be with you all today. Um, first of all, let's just go straight to the next slide and, and, and talk about, acknowledge what a difference a year makes. Um, if you look on the left side of the slide, you'll see an economic forecast from exactly a year ago. And the red arrow down shows where we were. And we didn't know where we were going from there, but the economic forecasters was looking at leading indicators and they were saying there's hope coming. The indicators are there that the economy is going to recover. Look to the right a year later and 
Yes, there have been some hiccups along the way with you know second waves and so forth, lock rolling lockdowns, um, all kinds of you know disruptions going on. But we have in fact climbed out of the deep hole, and the predict predictions are that we're going to grow this year. Uh, almost double that growth in 2022 and grow in 2023. So, so markets are rising, the resilience of the American economy um, powered by companies such as yourselves um, is, is definitely there. And so if you go to the next slide, um, what um, the key question for you, and I wanna pause here and then we gotta jump into the marketing leverage points really quickly, um, but is to decide where is your there? In other words, if the chart we were just looking at was your trajectory for your industry, is that the trend line you want to be on? Do you feel you need to be slightly below it because it was a rough year and maybe you have some supply disruptions? Or do you want to take the opportunity to just cut right through whatever the trend line is and accelerate your growth? And We've had many discussions with CEOs and their executives teams to sit down and first identify where are we today? Where's the starting point? And if we're fine where we are, then great. If staying here is not where we wanna be, what are the implications of staying here? Let's figure out from the CEO and perspective team of the team, where do we wanna to get to? What's our vision for growth? Why do we need to get there? What does that future state look like? What does that mean for our company and for our people? The plan, the, 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 the strategy and the plan is the how to get there. What's gonna be the hard part? What are the resource challenges? How are we gonna know what progress we're making? And Beth's even gonna talk a little bit about that later on as well. So, so it's making that decision. That is really the starting point. And then it becomes a, a mindset piece of it, mindset for growth. And it also becomes the rolling up the sleeves, developing the plan and then attacking the plan to, to generate the growth. If you go to the next slide, there are some really main takeaways for today, even though I'm only talking for like two more minutes. <laughs> Here are the takeaways. First of all, there is opportunity to accelerate into this markets recovery and drive more revenue, drive more margin, drive more share, just like Mark's been talking about. One key way to do that is to gain critical leverage in some key um, marketing aspects uh, that ultimately will do the best to support your sales team efforts. It's also important to be in the context of your customers and not only understand what's changed for you and your company and what your needs are, but what's changed for your customers' need, needs? How, how are they different today and forward versus where they were a year ago? There's a lot changed in the environment. There's a lot changed for your customer target, maybe even your, your customer's industry. So it's really an opportunity right now to sharpen your marketing advantage. And the quote um, that's been attributed to many, but this, Abraham Lincoln is the one I picked up on, is to give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four to sharpen the ax. Because if you've got sharp, sharp instruments, in this case, sharp, sharp strategies, then you can fell that tree faster than your competition and, and achieve the goal that, that you're seeking. So let's talk about what those critical marketing leverage points are on the next slide. And that, those are, are knowing your customer. So the, the, the point of these four items is that you can accelerate, you can grow your revenue and margin by getting more leverage from marketing. Marketing is often under leveraged in a business. So knowing your customer and you're all gonna say, well, I already know my customer, go on to point two. Let me challenge that just for a second because we're talking about knowing something very specific knowing who your decision makers are and what are their pain points, not just for the company, but what are, they, what are their pain points that need to be addressed, number one. Number two, what is their actual buying process? We talk mostly about this very you know, balanced triangle sales funnel as if they just drop right down through it into money in our wallet. That's not how it works. Uh, the B2B buyer or the B2C consumer has a, has a buying process and, and more and more digital 
has come into that. We know even in the B2B buying process, 81% of, of decision makers start their journey in online and they've consumed 15 to 20 pieces of content before they ever talk to a salesperson. They've spent 27% of their time researching online before they spend that 17% of their time talking to a salesperson. So decisions, people are more knowledgeable, decisions are 60% of the way through the process. So it's important to know your customer, how they buy, how they decide, what are their pain points in order to get an edge. Number two, make sure your differentiators matter. One of my clients was just sure their most important differentiator for their um, architectural firm was, was their prowess at design, that it was absolutely the best, nobody better. The customer's biggest priority was, yeah, they wanted design good enough, but their biggest priority was speed and follow-up. And the competition had this nailed. So it's important to make sure what you care about most and what you invest in terms of your differentiators are the ones that matter most to the customer. Otherwise, guess what? They don't really matter. So know your customer, make sure you, you, your differentiators matter. Talk to customers and learn that. And then take your, you wanna create and align your go-to-market plan with the prospect's decision process. So if customers are starting online, guess where you need to be? And you need to understand, and, and when we think about channel choices, we wanna be a little bit less random and not just say, hey, Let's go place an ad in that trade show magazine. Hey, let's do this digital campaign. Let's first understand the customer's buying process and then be where they are. Have, have the right message for the right prospect at the right time and in the right place in the right channel. And there's a way to mesh your channel strategy with knowledge about the customer's decision-making process. And then make sure the message is timely and relevant. Over the last year, Chief Outsiders value proposition stayed the same, but we changed our message that you would find on the homepage four times. One, when we were going into the pandemic, two, when we were starting to see our way out, and, and three and four, and right now our message is about accelerating into the market rise. So being very relevant, very timely with the context of our customers. So those are the key four points of marketing leverage. And the last couple of things I'll, I'll say to you are on these, on these last two slides, and then I think it's time for me to pass the baton. So go to the next slide, Mark. And that is, it's important to not just think about what companies' needs are and your products and services, because companies don't make decisions, people make decisions. So that's why understanding your decision makers and what their pain points is so critical. And the final point um, to address the margin advantage is that differentiation is the antidote to commodity. So the example of being certain that your differentiators are lined up with the customers, what they value the most, that is margin money in the bank. Thanks, thanks Deborah. That's uh, um, that was a a, a masterclass in yeah eight minutes, <laughs> so yeah and yeah we'll send information. Deborah can can share with you a little bit more about the how uh, afterwards if you want to explore that with, with her. So we're gonna go you know once you've you've been clear with your customers and you've got some some top line movement, uh, you got to be able to to deliver on your products. So Beth Berman is going to talk about um, you know, setting up a structure and a process to make your operations work. Beth is a certified EOS implementer. Beth? Okay, thank you, Mark. First slide, yep, there we go. So um, Deborah gave me a, a great lead in, really focusing on growth, where we want to take a company. Now, the question is, how do you create a structure? How do you create process? How do you create um, an organization that can execute, not only draw those people in, those ideal customers who are best fit, 
but operate in such a way that we can get the results we want, whether our goals are maybe more control over the company, maybe we are wanting to sell in X number of years, maybe we want to have a succession plan, maybe we want to franchise, maybe we want to stay boutique, but maybe make a greater impact in the world, whatever the goal of the company, what's most important is that strengthening your operations to execute on clear aligned goals involves having some sort of a structure. So what I'm going to give you today is a framework that, um, that I work with called EOS or the, oper the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Some people also call it traction, but it's actually called EOS. Um, and EOS focuses on three things, vision, traction, healthy. So what I am purporting for you is whether it's EOS or another system, I would like you to have a system that focuses on vision, getting everybody in the organization 100% aligned on where they want to go and how you want to get there. Next, traction, creating discipline and accountability, making it happen in such a way that you are executing on that goal throughout the organization, clear lines of accountability, clear lines of uh, responsibility, clear communication. Um, we're still staying at this point in the slide. <laughs> okay. um, then the next piece is healthy. You know, business is hard. And maybe when oh. you started your businesses, it, it was fun, it was exciting. But over time, what happens is, it's not fun anymore. It's hard. We're not lacking in politics, emotion, politicking, all of these kinds of things, territories, friction that doesn't get resolved. So what we want to do is we want to create a, a strong, healthy team that has fun again, where it's scalable, it's growable, and so forth. So taking, go back if you would, two clicks, Mark. What EOS is about is, a, is, is a based on a discovery. And that discovery is that to the extent you can take all of your issues and sort them into six key components and then strengthen those components, that's where you get what you want from your business. And your ability to solve issues is directly related to your success. So let me break the model down and then I'm going to share some tools with you. So the first one is vision. And vision is about getting everyone 100% on the same page with where you want to go and how you plan to get there. In our system, we have a two-page or two-element document we call the Vision Traction Organizer. Mark, you can take us to it. Thank you. Oops. The Vision Traction Organizer that will help us align around eight questions. So what are the eight questions and why are they important? First of all, you as leaders want to align around these eight questions from the standpoint of what you, where you want to go, where, what you want to accomplish, how you plan to get there before rolling this out to the organization. So you're going to get aligned around eight questions. And before I actually do this, I'd just like to take one step back because I didn't take you around the wheel, my bad. <laughs> so the vision component, the plan and, how, and the vision of where you wanna go, how you plan to get there. Next, people. So people are our most critical asset and they're also our, our most challenging. The idea, a la Jim Collins, is we need right people in the right seats. We need great people who fit our organizations sitting in the right seats where they're fantastic at their jobs. When you've got a strong vision and you strengthen the people component and sort your issues into these components, the next piece we want to strengthen is data. So we're not multinational corporations. We are entrepreneurial businesses. You are leaders of entrepreneurial businesses. And the idea here is you want to have the right amount of data, not reams of data, but the right amount of data to give you an absolute pulse on the business. Then when vision 
is clear and everybody's aligned first at the leadership level and then throughout the organization, the next piece is, and people are great and you've got clear data, what happens is you become transparent and just like black ink on my white shirt, issues pop out. I said before, your ability to solve issues directly related to your success. We will talk about issue solving and, and how and where that takes place and should take place in an organization. But ideally, you want to create a culture where your people are not afraid to bring issues forward, where they are willingly bringing issues forward, where issues are being prioritized, they're being solved, and, they're, and you're making them go away forever rather than kicking the can down the road or not my problem or those kinds of things. So we want to create a culture where issues are solved. Next is process. And what we find in organizations is there's either too much process or not enough process. But it, it, what you want to do is get to a level where you've got all of your core processes documented at, a, at an entrepreneurial level so that you're not inundated, you're not putting straitjackets on people, no 500 page SOPs like the government. We want the right amount of process so that we can do things the right and best way every time. So we get consistency, repeatability, scalability, more profit, more fun. And finally, the piece that brings it together is traction. And traction is about executing on the vision, discipline and accountability. So back to that next slide, the vision traction organizer. This is an example of how to organize those questions and align around it so that you get clear on your vision. So first question, core values. Maybe you have core values, maybe you don't. But core values reflect who you are as an organization and we're not talking now about just words on a page, words on a website. These are principles to live by. And we use core values to uh, attract, recruit, hire, recognize, maybe fire, coach up, coach out. And I'm going to show you a tool in a little while about making that you can use to make your core values come to life and have them be. Uh, something that helps you coach your people up, coach your people out, create a culture where everyone fits like a glove and is super powerful. Um, the next question that we want to align around is your core focus. Now we're staying on the slide, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, your core focus. So we know with core values who you are. Core focus is what you love to do and are best at. The next piece 10 year target, where you wanna go. One rallying cry for the organization. Then marketing strategy. The elements that Deborah talked about, you wanna be crystal clear on those elements and simplify them and stay to, for example, your differentiators. Three year picture, where are you gonna be in just three years so you can motivate your people? Next slide, please. And then you connect it to what is your one year plan? What are your priorities for the year? Break it down into the quarter. What are your priorities for the quarter? And have a place for your issues. Now, quick uh, present presentation of the people analyzer tool. Here's where you bring your core values to life. So if you'll click again, Mark. Oops, sorry, the animation's not there anymore. But on the, on the top level should be your core values, whatever your core values are. And the idea here is, let's say, for example, your core value is uh, professionalism. The idea here is to say to your people, not, hey, lose the ripped T-shirt and take out the nose ring. Maybe you say to that person, hey, Joe, you're great at your job, but you know what? We're all about professionalism. We need you to dress the part. We need your help. That's how you can coach people up to who you are as a company and your energy. Next slide, please. 
Next piece is scorecard. And this is about having an absolute pulse on your business. So we talk about numbers, we talk about growth, we talk about profit. This is, we start with measurables, leading and lagging indicators, a handful of numbers that you're going to want to keep track of, not reams of data, as I said. You're gonna have a target for those numbers based on the accountability chart that you build and having clear roles and accountability that is also part of this, you'll then have 13 weeks of history to help you see what's on track and off track in your business. Now, bringing that down to the ground, the next piece is accountability a clear structure for the organization and bringing people with clarity around what they're accountable for and then tying, having a place to tie it all together with a meeting structure. If you would just show me the uh, last slide, Mark, very quickly. Um, the idea here is most meetings are boring. You want to have a meeting structure where you're doing your reporting very quickly. Meetings are boring because they do a lot of reporting. And then have most of your time focused on your issues and your to-dos and making sure the right things are getting done, the right priorities, building towards your goals. Taken all together, this takes you to a place where you're operating, you've got great people, you've got clear data, You've got um, your issues being solved. You've got process for the right about, amount of scalability. And finally, traction, bringing it all together. And Mark, if you were just in a living document that ties together all of your components. So uh, that's what helps you get operationally as a strong company. And that's what helps you grow, scale, and get what you want from your business. Mark? Yeah, th thanks, Beth. And we're, and we're using this. It's it's not easy. It's you can look at this and, and say, oh yeah, I got it. I'll, I'll do it. But implementing it and re you know, pushing it out through your your whole company is a challenge. But boy, does it, it make things uh, more efficient. And it's, it's a steady process. It's not something that just gets implemented quickly. So th thanks, Beth. So the last piece, we've talked about top line growth with Deborah and getting things uh, operationally efficient with Beth. Uh, our last uh, expert is Aaron Gase, who is a shareholder and M&A uh, attorney for Shulman Rogers. And he's going to talk about a, a number of areas where you need to, to manage risk and prepare yourself for, for growth and sale. Thanks so much, Mark and, and Beth and Deborah. Great to be with you all today. Good afternoon. I'm Aaron Gase. As Mark said, I'm a a shareholder at the law firm of Showman Rogers. I'm an M&A attorney and business uh, counselor. I've, I've helped my clients buy, sell, and finance their businesses for 25 years. I've, I've closed many hundreds of deals and have a lot of war stories I could share with you that uh, you'd probably enjoy and laugh at. But since I only have 10 minutes or less, we're going to do a, a flyby here on some on some really key points that may on their face sound dry, but I assure you, they are important and, and should be important to you in, in how you operate your business day to day from a legal standpoint. And even more important, if you are looking to the day of possibly selling your business and wanting to maximize the return. So you know, many of you, if you've got mature businesses, and I know, I know you all do, you've worked with lawyers um, you know, and, and, and kind of the run of the mill lawyer will, is somebody who um, will help you uh, kind of worry about things so that you don't have to worry about things. And they're, they're conservative. They're always assuming the glass is half empty, looking for problems always, maybe not facilitating your growth. For me, as a business lawyer over 25 years, I've learned to, that to be really effective for my clients, I need to certainly do those things. But, but on top of that, on top of being a, a cautious and careful lawyer, I also need to be a, a business-minded and, and a good business person as well. So I always try to bring those two things to bear on, on issues that we encounter. So what I want to talk about here are, is uh, four things in particular that I think if you can do better than you're currently doing, you will protect not only protect yourself, but also increase the multiple of the valuation of your business um, when that day comes when you want to try to sell your business for maximum value. So let me run through these. There, there are four of them, as I said, and a fifth point, if there's time, I'll get to that as well. So the first point is protect your intellectual property. 
So by this intellectual property, I mean intellectual property in the broader sense, not only patents, trademarks, copyrights, but also things like trade secrets, inventions, work product developed not only by your employees, but also by your independent contractors. So you, you, it's, I think most people know that for um, things that are ideas that are patentable or uh, marks that um, you've developed to represent your business, you can get and should get those registered with the Patent and Trademark Office, if only because if somebody else tries to use it, you'll have stronger rights in protecting, um, in protecting those intellectual property uh, rights. But there are other, other things that you really should do and, and, and um, take very seriously that do at least as much, if not more, to protect your intellectual property. And, and let me tick through those two things. One is just be sure your employees sign well-drafted agreements that clarify that any work product or any inventions that they, they develop um, in, in the course of working for you, uh, that those are deemed to be the company's property and assigned to the company. Oh. And that also, um, you know, that also impose confidentiality requirements on your people so that they are not free to use your company's secrets and intellectual property for other purposes other than gr growing your business. And the second point there here is, is very similar with your independent contracts. So we just talked about your employees, but your independent contractors should also uh, sign agreements that, are, that very clearly provide that any sort of work product or inventions that they produce while performing the engagement that's the subject of, of the, of the in consulting agreement or in, in, uh, independent contractor agreement with them, that that intellectual property is deemed assigned to and belongs to the company. Quick horror story on that client of mine, didn't let me look at their IC agreement, outsourced work to an Indian company to do some website development. They used, they relied on the Indian company's contract that contract did not provide that the $30,000 worth of website development um, work product belonged to the company. So years went by, we went to try to sell the company and it turned out that the Indian company owned all of that intellectual property. And so we had to buy it back. So that, that's just one horror story to hopefully um, make that a little more real for you. Point number two, um, sounds really boring, but uh, you know it's, it's important, which is get your contracts in order. And this is particularly important for companies, probably many of yours that uh, do generate, you know, that, that have customer contracts. Uh, the more of them, uh, the more of them, the harder they are to administer. Um, some companies don't rely on contracts. Maybe it's just work orders or purchase orders, but many of you do. And, and so it seems um, simple and common sense that business contracts should be signed, kept together online in an organized fashion, reviewed and administered on an ongoing basis. But unfortunately, it's easy to lose track of that housekeeping as you try to grow your business and respond to everyday customer and client demand. So are your contracts all signed? Seems like a simple point, but um, you know, check and make sure. Are they organized online in an orderly fashion? Do you know the, the terms of the contracts, the termination date, how long the contract lasts, renewal terms, do you know whether those contracts are assignable to a buyer if you are selling your company? Um, why is this important? I mean, among, among a whole bunch of other reasons, if you uh, go to sell your company, one of the first things a buyer will ask for in the preliminary due diligence is for a copy of all of the contracts that are material to your business. If you can't produce those in an orderly and, 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 and expedited way, you're going to start raising questions in your prospective buyer's mind about whether you've really got um, a business here that, that's worth buying. And if you're able to respond quickly and everything's in order, it only encourages the, um, you know, encourages your buyer and, and the buyer's enthusiasm. So all these things lend to company value. Third point, your cap table, of, you know, do you know who owns your business? So again, seems really simple. And, and as with the contracts, right, it's like, it seems obviously, of course you know who owns your company and it's easy if you're the only owner or if it's just you and a few other people, but where this gets more com complicated and challenging. And I do see business owners stumble over this repeatedly, particularly where there are more than a handful of shareholders. Maybe there's phantom equity or share appreciation rights, outstanding options, convertible promissory notes, safes, uh, and, and, and venture and other outside investors maybe with preferred equity. Uh, it, it can get complicated very quickly if you're not tracking it. 
And it gets even more complicated if you, like other business owners, have done things like promise equity to people. That might be a binding promise. Or maybe you've hired some people recently, and in those offer letters that you gave them in the last few months, you said that you would give them some options or some sort of phantom equity. All of that needs to be taken in and digested from a legal and business standpoint and reflected in, in a thoughtful, accurate cap table, we'll call it cap table capitalization table, that reflects not only who owns the common and preferred equity in your company, but also reflects instruments like promissory note, like convertible promissory notes that are convertible into equity on certain events. Um, so those are those are some um, basic but but critical but critical uh, things you should do there. The last one I'll mention is your personnel policies and and um, the protections you've set up for your workplace. So in the wake of the of the Me Too and the and the Black Lives Matter movements, there is increased sensitivity uh, amongst um, employees and also potential buyers of your business in the areas of discrimination and harassment in the workplace. This in turn has just increased the importance of putting in place appropriate policies and procedures and employee training to address potential discrimination and, and harassment in your workplace, to make your workplace a safe place. Uh, obviously important for your people that are working there first and foremost, but from a, from a business standpoint, it, it, um, among other reasons, eliminating bad behavior in the workplace will minimize your business's liability exposure, but also allow you to respond effectively to due diligence inquiries uh, made by potential buyers of your business and also to respond appropriately upon receiving complaints or uh, lawsuits filed against your business in, in these areas. So um, quick, quick example, working, uh, closed a deal recently, a senior executive in the business had been the subject of, let's call it a handful of complaints um, we, my law firm worked with that business uh, pre-sale to address some of their procedures and compliance, and we did training. And as a result of those efforts and the fact that there was never actually a formal action or lawsuit filed against this executive, we were able to effectively respond to um, due diligence inquiries made by our prospective buyer, put that buyer at, at ease, and proceed to closing without that becoming a major issue. But that, that executive's behavior might have become a big issue and stalled or even, um, e even prevented the sale of the business if, if we hadn't dealt with it in the way that we did. So those, those um, mitigation and compliance and efforts and the training and a, a proper um, reporting process, all of those things have value, not only to your people, which is the most important thing, but to you as a business owner. Finally, as you think about all these things, you can see everything I've addressed here kind of sounds dry, or at least a lot of it does, critical to value, critical to ex eliminating liability exposure to you, but also really important to you as you try to build the value of your business and assure a, a, a highest possible um, price upon a sale event. As you work through these things, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get a good lawyer on your team. Um, I'm, I'm here for you if you need me. Uh, but also other advisors start bringing those people together, your CPA, your financial advisor, an investment banker, potentially a marketing consultant like Deborah, a business advisor like Beth, get your team in place and start thinking holistically about your legal and business needs and how addressing those needs actually not only protects you against liability, but improves the increases the value of your business. Thank you. Great, thanks, Aaron. <clears throat> Does anybody have any, any, any quick questions for Deborah or Beth or Aaron? Okay, so we've, we've gotten to the point where we've, you, you've done your own assessments, we've looked at how yours compare to other companies. Um, we can go, go, go deeper, but you sort of have three options from here. One is, uh, I've got my discover assessment. It's uh, admittedly a low resolution, but I, I have some questions about specifics, about what that actually means for my company. I'm happy to have a, a conversation with you about your particular results, uh, have some, some, uh, some discussion around you know, how other companies in the same situation address their growth opportunities. The second is, you know, so I, I you know, we'll do that. Second is I 
who would like a little more data. And I'll explain in just a second how that works. This uh, first part is just the, the 18 questions, one per driver. There's a second deeper one that looks in more detail at each one of those three to five questions about each one. So the sales and marketing gets to market data, sales effectiveness, training, processes, et cetera. So we can find out what that, that actually means. And when the second uh, assessment is taken, sometimes there can be dramatic changes in, in the value or the growth opportunities available. So we can do what's called uh, the unlock uh, assessment. It's more of a deeper dive. And the third is, I think I've got it. I know what I want to do. I've got a particular issue, whether it's operations or growth or something. Um, I'd like to, to get started on uh, some kind of alignment and accountability focus on my, uh, my, my operations. So let's just talk quickly about, about uh, the unlock. The unlock, your process took 10 minutes by yourself. Uh, the unlock is a, is a deeper dive. It can take you know, one and a half to three hours, depending on how vigorous the conversation is and how much discussion you have. It's really great to do it with your management team because I've never found a management team that was all in alignment, um, but they were surprised how different their answers were for this. And so it, it le leads to a lot of discussion, sometimes rather heated discussion, about, well, you don't know what's going on. Why are you saying this? Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. So it's a cathartic uh, experience, just the process itself. It leaves you with some very specific growth tasking for each one of those, those things. So, you know, company overview, there's something specific about, you know, clarifying what the company is, what they do, what they mean to others. Some of the things that Deborah talked about. Um, as you tackle these individual tasks, the information you provide is put into a data room. You know, for example, if growth is an issue and you need to, to get estimates of revenue and profit for your uh, competitors, we're thinking whoever gets that, well, boy, that makes your company more valuable if you have a good handle on that. So that data room, and then it puts, puts a lot of alignment and accountability. It may be that one person is responsible for your biggest you know, data you know, value gaps or for all your great growth opportunities. Is that the right person? Talking, talking about what Beth said, is the, is the right person on, on the bus, the people? So anyway, that's, that's uh, where we go. I think the core value assessment tool and framework is, is an incredible tool. It's being used widely. And a lot of people find uh, just like the EOS system or Deborah or Aaron's, uh, advice about you know putting some structure down and getting uh, your, your your marketing and your legal systems and your operations uh, better organized um, is a really powerful way to drive that that, that growth. So just a final final pitch about uh, AEG. You know what we do is really we're we're a, 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 an ecosystem of advisors, about fifty advisors in complementary disciplines including financial, personal, business growth, technology, uh, benefits, HR, uh, et cetera, wealth manager, estate planners. Um, and we can look at any stage of growth in your business. Uh, we'll work with your team or your advisors. We're looking for a long-term relationship because we can take you through the whole process of growing, getting started to a 5 million to a 50 million and, you know, in our dreams, uh, a bigger company. But ultimately, we're really focused on helping the, the mid-market business owner you know, grow their business, add value, uh, get to the point where they can exit on their own terms and build personal wealth. So I wanna thank you all. We'll, we'll reach out to you afterwards and, and see if uh, there, there's something else we can do for you and give you some insights on the assessment that you took. And um, we're gonna have a discussion. Any other comments? Tom or Mo or, or Jeff? Just thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, pretty okay. well rounded and uh, very to the point and the slides were well well executed and um, very, very enlightening. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, appreciate the, the time and the presentations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you as well. Terrific. Thanks guys. And thanks to our panelists, uh, Deborah, Aaron, and Beth. Oh, yeah, we don't want to forget them. <laughs> Good luck to everyone, and we hope we can help. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.